Hello and welcome to my channel. My name is Alonda Carter and I am the Recovering Hunbot. I create anti-MLM videos, so if you enjoyed that type of content, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Today's video, I share with you the concept of reciprocity within the context of multi-level marketing. If you would like to support this type of content and me as a creator, the very best way you can do so is joining my Patreon. I've made it really simple. I've created three tiers. They're all very reasonable, ranging from a dollar to $10 a month, and literally any amount helps. And now, on with the video. As I started reaching out to other people that I'm inviting to be on my channel for my segment, Hey Hun, You Woke Up, this book right here, um, it's called Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion, written by Robert, Robert Cialdini. I may not be saying that correctly. The first chapter, the author talks about automatic stereotype behavior that helps us, you know, as humans, you know, like operate and be more efficient. Let me go ahead and give you an example. Okay, picture this. There is a jewelry store in a tourist area. I want to say it was New Mexico. It might have been Arizona. It's one of those. Anyway, they were selling turquoise jewelry and couldn't get rid of this stuff and couldn't get rid of it. And then one day, the shop owner is going out of town. And so, you know, writes a note. The person who receives the note mistakes one half for a two. And so they put all the jewelry in a single case and double the price. And lo and behold, it sells out. I mean, not a speck of turquoise jewelry to be found within the shop. Why? Well, the tourist had conceived that expensive equals good. Something else that the author discusses is the principle of contrast. You may or may not remember this, but back in the day, there actually was a TV show called Charlie's Angels long before the first movie release, long before the most recent reboot, there was a TV show. So anyway, the study was like having people rate attractiveness. And they did this with people not watching Charlie's Angels and while people were watching Charlie's Angels and all of the people that they gave them, you know, they were average attractive. But when people were rating the attractiveness while watching Charlie's Angels, because, you know, the women are more highly attractive than most, all of a sudden the rating went down due to contrast. They were seeing what they considered more beautiful versus average, and now all of a sudden the average people become less attractive. Now let's contrast this concept of contrast with multi-level marketing or endless level marketing recruitment type schemes and people who are dissatisfied with work. There's a lot of people out there unhappy with their job. And so then when an opportunity is presented that's going to solve those issues, give them the life that they're dreaming about, the freedom of time, the freedom with money, all of that. And they may not even say those things. The recruiter may not say, you'll have more money, far more money than nine to five. It might be subtly implied. All of a sudden, that opportunity looks really good. The second chapter of this book is titled Reciprocation. And as I started reading it, my social science brain started ticking. If you don't know this, I have a master's in anthropology. And believe it or not, I still have most all of the books that I read as a graduate student. I don't have the papers and well, I think I have them on discs somewhere. Anyway, uh, there's a lot of stuff I don't have. I don't have all my class notes and you know, just all this stuff. But I do have a lot of the books. And so my brain is going and I'm like, what is this reminding me of? What is this reminding me of? And so while I'm just like mulling over the function of multi-level marketing, because I had joined Beachbody and I'm thinking about how, you know, there's this feedback loop that you, you just keep repeating this and I don't have it fully, you know, fleshed out. And even when I'm presenting to you, it's not fully fleshed out. These are just like my initial thoughts as, you know, my, my brain in anthropology starts waking back up. And so I kept thinking about it and thinking about it. And then all of a sudden, boom, this name comes to me, Herbert Spencer. So I go to my bookshelf and I grab 
this book. High points in anthropology. P.S. This book is out of print, and before I ever went to graduate school, it was out of print. I just happen to be kind of a freak that I'll go to a bookstore and buy books that interest me, and I was at a used bookstore here in Houston, and I, I bought this book probably two years before I ever went off to graduate school. So I had it, and so I opened it up, and it, literally it is falling apart, like the pages are falling out of it, and lo and behold, there he is, my buddy, Herbert Spencer, and then I see this one word, and something just goes click, and that one word is super organic. Spencer conceived of society as being a um, social organism, and that it evolved, you know, from simple to more complex, you know, kind of following like the laws of evolution. And that's how he coined the term super organic. Alfred Kroeber, another anthropologist, an American anthropologist, he studied under Franz Boas. Franz Boas is the father of American anthropology. Anyway, Kroeber just kind of, you know, took that idea and tweaked it a bit. Human beings are organic creatures, according to Kroeber. And this concept of culture operates outside of the human, but has a life of its own. And so to him, that life of its own, that culture is operating outside of the human being, that to him was super organic. So now we're going to turn to um, someone who did amazing work in the study of cult, the late Dr. Margaret Thayer, Thaler Singer. Anyway, I probably didn't say that right. But she studied undue influence in social and religious contexts. According to Singer, cults do not disclose their true nature because most people would never join if they did. If you've been a member of a multi-level marketing company, doesn't that sound a bit familiar? According to Singer, the art of deception is employed. And this art of deception prevents recruits from asking too many questions. Because, you know, if they start asking questions, all of a sudden they start getting love bomb. Now, love bomb is a way of, you know, a sense of flattery. Oh, you'd be great at this. Oh, you look so wonderful. You know, it's ways to make you feel good. And that feels good, right? Don't you like to be flattered? I, know. I mean, hello, I do. According to Singer, anyone can be vulnerable to cult membership. When someone is at a vulnerable state in their life, like, you know, in between meaningful jobs, meaningful relationships, just kind of, you know, just things just aren't going all that well. And there's just this sense of, you know, like not belongingness. That's a state of vulnerability. And that's when someone may be susceptible to joining something that under normal circumstances, they wouldn't. Overall, according to Singer, people who study cults say that there's not like some kind of special person that joins cults. It's literally when someone is at a vulnerable state, they're more susceptible. And that's the point that they will join. Now, let me give you an example, okay? Because this is what happened to me. Way before I became a Beachbody coach, I was an instructional designer. As a matter of fact, I have a second master's degree in instructional design. And I always kind of felt like a paid monkey. And this was going on year after year after year. And then in 2015, I had been recently remarried. And that August, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And so, you know, I went through, I'm okay now. So, you know, I, I, I went through all the things that you go through. And then when I went back to work on December 7th of that year, I was laid off. As a matter of fact, about 80% of the department was laid off. So I was at a vulnerable state and then we moved and I started doing independent contract work, remote work. I was working from home, but it was still, you know, this instructional design stuff that wasn't fulfilling me. And as a matter of fact, the gig that I had, I would say routinely, oh my gosh, I'll just hurl myself off the balcony in front of the light rail because we lived on Main Street and on Main Street, the light rail goes up and down here in Houston. And I mean, it just, to me, that seemed like, okay, let me just get it over with. It's like, I was so sick of what I was doing. Well, this is around the time, you know, I meet my cult recruiter. My cult recruiter was a neighbor. And I actually met her originally on Yelp. So for me, the opportunity with the Beachbody, it seemed to 
answer what I was looking for. I was dissatisfied. I'd gone through, you know, a, a terrible health crisis. So I was at this heightened state of being vulnerable. Now, let me explain to you what reciprocity is, you know, and you can think that, yes, it is gift giving, but, you know, gift giving can be in different forms. Reciprocity can be defined as exchange for mutual benefit, which can occur at the macro or micro level. Now, remember, I have like all of these, you know, anthropology books. So I kept thinking, and one of the things that came to my mind was um, the Kula Ring. The anthropologist, Brownslaw Melanowski, I say his last name far better than his first name, but he studied exchange and economics specifically. And his most famous work is this right here. He studied... Um, this complex exchange that's referred to as the Kula Ring. And according to him, this exchange system is related to political authority. But if you think about, like, you know, as I go on, think about how authority is um, perpetuated in an exchange system within the context of multi-level marketing. Now, that's not something that I've gone through too much within this, but I just, you know, I started thinking about the cooler ring because it has to do with this exchange. And then I thought of someone else. And the next person I thought about is Marcel Mauss. Marcel Mauss is most famous for um, the gift. Marcel Mauss is the nephew of Emile Durkheim. Durkheim um, was a French sociologist, and he developed um, social structure theories, including functional including functionalism, which emphasizes social equilibrium and states um, of one part of society changes. And as it changes, it impacts the whole of society. Mouse's most influential work, like I said, is The Gift, in which he analyzed gift giving and the obligation of gift giving. According to Mouse, in primitive societies, gift exchange encompasses a sense of power and a commodity. For example, Maus describes the potlatch, a gift-giving feast practiced in the Pacific Northwest, in which it involves giving away items which signify the leader's wealth and power. Another American anthropologist, this guy's name is Marshall Salins, he had identified three types of reciprocity. Generalized reciprocity is gift exchange without the expectation of receiving something immediately in return. Say, for instance, you know, you go to Starbucks and you buy your buddy, you know, a, a latte. You're not going to expect them to just like, you know, buy you one right away. But there might be another point in time that, you know, you're, you're thinking, they'll get me back. Balance reciprocity is explicit expectation of immediate return. For example, you go to a restaurant, you order food, and you get the food, so they're expecting you to pay for it. Negative reciprocity is the third one that Salins presented. And he says this involves trickery or coercion of sorts because one person is receiving something less than what they've given. So there's an unbalance there. Overall, negative reciprocity is a way to kind of like trick people to give away more of, you know, something of more value than what they receive in return. According to Cialdini, there are rules of obligation that are constant within humans, with our, within you know, human culture. He uses this experiment called the Reagan experiment. I'm just gonna call it that for short because it, it makes it easier. And with it, he says it, it shows how this rule can be exploited if someone sees it as a source of influence. So this is how the study goes, all right. So there's going to be this study on art appreciation. So the guy who is, you know, showing pictures of art or whatever, at one point he's like, oh, I need a break. He goes and takes a break and he comes back and he has a Coke. Well, then he brings the person who's grading the art, he brings them a Coke and he offers it to them. The person always accepts it. Other times he goes and gets a Coke, but he doesn't offer it to someone. So now, when he asked them later to buy raffle tickets because, you know, his son was selling these raffle tickets or whatever, those who received a Coke from him buy more raffle tickets than those 
who did not receive a Coke. Th those that didn't get a Coke, they, they still buy things. But those who received the Coke, that whole thing of like, you know, you gave me something, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you back. That came into play. Another example that he uses, are, and you may not be familiar with this, Hare Krishnas. Hare Krishnas were very big and used to be in airports like all over the place. And they would ask for money. They were a re religious cult. And, and people kind of thought they were a little bit weird and stuff. And then all of a sudden, they started giving people a simple gift. Just a simple flower, handing a flower. And when people received the flower, they were more apt to give something in return, even if they didn't want it. And they would often say, I don't want it. It didn't matter. They're just saying, it's our gift to you. And then they would ask for money. And so they would get money from whoever they gave them a flower. Now, I don't have the numbers of the number of people that did this, but overall, just the simple act of giving something, even an uninvited gift, somebody felt obligated. People felt obligated to repay that. Something else that can be triggered because you're still, you're going to give is if there's an unfair obligation. For instance, there's this, within the book, there's this story of this person who her car was not, you know, didn't start. And so this guy came along and helped her and jumped her car and he was a neighbor. And then Several days later, a couple of weeks later, all of a sudden he comes by and asks to borrow her car because she was like, you know, come by any time. Let me know if I can help you out. Well, what he's asking for is by far greater than what she got. But she felt that sense of obligation. And so she handed her keys over and, you know, the guy ended actually, he wrecked the car. So let's talk about uneven exchange within the context of multi-level marketing. People who join multi-level marketing, like myself, are often vulnerable because there's something in their life that they're not happy with. I am contending that when people join multi-level marketing, they perceive that they're getting more than what they're given. And I'm going to use the example of unique because this is the one that comes in mind because there's always these presenter kits that I see. And let's just say the presenter kit, I believe it's always $99. And then there's always like, this is $450 worth of stuff. And so it looks like you're getting more than, you know, what you're actually paying for. So it evokes this, you know, this like, I have to pay it back kind of a feeling. So when you join, you, you get this sense of, you know, I have an obligation to the company because they're giving me this opportunity. Does that make sense? And since I have this opportunity, I have to work my business and show my commitment and be part of the crowd. So you become the get along gang. Now, there was another example that Cialdini, and I'm, again, I'm probably just not saying it right, you know, get over it. Anyway, there's another example of someone who is selling tickets to a Boy Scout event. And this person didn't have time to go. And so, you know, after the guy refuses, then the Boy Scout's like, well, can you buy some chocolate? Dude ends up buying some chocolate because he perceives that the child, you know, made a concession. It's, you know, not as much. It's a couple of bucks. I'll go ahead and get me a chocolate bar. Well, this is also the case within multi-level marketing. It makes me think about Beachbody. And back in the day when I was hunting, we'd sell challenge packs. And these challenge packs in general for about 140, 160 bucks. And if somebody couldn't afford that, well, then we'd, you know, knock it down to something a little bit lower. But we always started with the most expensive type thing so that we had that wiggle room because we were trying to illustrate that we were making a concession so that then the person on the other end would make a concession as well. Now, what I'm putting forth is, you know, I'm thinking there is this, this sense of extended reciprocation that happens when you join multi-level marketing. You buy into the opportunity and, and, and you struggle. I mean, let's put it out there. Most people are on the struggle bus. However, you remain indebted because you perceive that what you are given is more. You, you know, get this mentorship. You get guidance because you have this person above you that's helping you. You get put in these Facebook groups and you know all these things are going on. So you're perceiving that you're getting more than what, what you're actually giving. Typically, when you join Beachbody, you will be put in the person who recruited you, um, their group. But if they don't have a group because, you know, they haven't formed a team yet because 
they're on the struggle bus and they just happen to, you know, suck you into it or whatever. You know, there's going to, there's going to be a group that you're put in. And sometimes some of these opportunities, there'll, there'll be multiple groups that you're put in. And then if you're like me, because you know, you're, you're going to make this thing work, you start seeking out other groups. I mean, I remember joining Beachbody Champions and all kinds of different other things because I was trying to, you know, to find the way to find the help so I could just make everything click. Anytime you hear someone who is sharing their success story, you perceive them as a guru. The thing is with multi-level marketing, unlike with religious cults, there's not a single guru. There's multiple gurus. The guru can be the CEO. For me, as a Beachbody coach, guru served as, you know, the the people who were on the stage, you know, the people who were the 15 star diamonds. It also was the super trainers. Anyone that was coming to speak to you can be perceived as the guru. And that person is giving you some information that you can then act on. And because you're given this information, you feel obligated to act on it because you're seeking to make your business work. This obligation can occur because you we're on a team call. You were, you know, in these different groups. You saw some kind of, you know, post in there, somebody's live video, whatever, in any way that you are receiving information that you think is going to help you, that further obligates you to continue working your business. I see multi-level marketing as an overall system operating over or above the system of society and culture. In addition, multi-level marketing, it seems to operate within social culture and in harmony with the individual and the collective. On the surface, the umbrella of multi-level marketing states that it has some sort of a mission that it's going to help, you know, to improve the world in some way. This is seen in various mottos of companies, such as like with Beachbody. Beachbody's mission is to help people achieve their goals and live a healthy and fulfilling life. Now, who does not want that? In this example, it is implied that people are unable to achieve goals on their own and need support, and that their lives are not healthy or fulfilling. There is but one answer, and that one answer is Beachbody. The multi-level marketing is put forth as being the savior. Multi-level marketing as a savior will get you out of the nine to five rat race. However, when you look beyond what multi-level marketing tells you it's going to offer and look underneath it, it is an operation that seeks to extort money from its members. Anyone joining pays into the overall system. However, the only people who actually earn are those who are at the C-level within the corporation and those who are the founding distributors. The founding distributors in general were targeted because the, you know, they were known to be able to recruit. The only way the system survives is to have a constant influx from the bottom that pays the top. I'm not sure if that makes sense. Again, this is my first crack at all of this, so I'm just trying to explain it as it's come. In my opinion, upon joining, it is perceived that there is a balanced exchange. For instance, you get, you know, a challenge pack in Beachbody, and because you decide to join, the, the, the fee is waived, because there's always this joining fee, but it's waived. So you, you, you perceive that there's some sort of concession, and this serves to strengthen the bond. And so then you perceive that opportunity as, you know, helping you to leave that nine to five grind. In my opinion, up on joining, I think it's perceived that there is a balanced exchange, but in reality, it is unbalanced because you are getting less than what you think, but you think you're getting more. Often when you first join, you think there is some sort of concession, just like I said, you know, with what Unique does. And there's also a concession in Beachbody that if you become a Beachbody coach, when you buy a challenge pack, they'll waive the sign up fee. Usually there's a way to make it very appealing to you where you think you're, you know, you're kind of like getting one over on them. And you also feel like, you're being given such a great opportunity. But then as more time goes on, 
this exchange becomes unbalanced because you are continuing to pay into the system. Within an infinite level marketing scheme or a rigged market, you become caught in an endless obligatory feedback loop based on perceived balance reciprocity. To begin, you perceive that the opportunity is a legitimate solution and that it is going to provide to you the time, freedom, and income you desire. You become obligated to continue purchasing the product. The product is a powerful symbol of the opportunity, which further strengthens the mental bond to it. It serves as a reminder of your obligation and you take action to reciprocate the quote gift. In addition, the social media groups you may join or, you know, that are related to the company or attending any kind of meeting, whether it's remote or if it's a conference or any kind of, you know, where you're, you're getting information from people, this further perpetuates the sense of obligation and continues the cycle. When you receive what you believe to be knowledge that you can implement, which will transform your life, you go back into the loop. However, it only keeps you within the extended obligatory loop to earn your, quote, mission of freedom, because your mission is to have freedom. Extended obligation refers to the secrets you are told about in any of those meetings that you attend, you know? That you, that you find out when you are within groups or at conferences, all of those bonding you to the overall system. There is this sense to return the favor and persevere even when your monetary and time output are more than what you are receiving in return. I see the products that are on auto ship or, you know, monthly order sometimes that people need to have or, you know, or symbolic representations of obligation that keep you. The purchase of outside courses, masterminds, or coaching products serve as extensions of your obligation because they are providing you with actions to take that you are told will lead you to success. This is what I'm thinking about right now as there being this systematic control through this ongoing sense of obligation, of extending the obligation to keep you further and further within that endless feedback loop of giving more than what you're receiving because you're expecting to be able to create the life that you first thought you were going to have by what you were told when you were recruited. Let, let me know if this makes any kind of sense. I mean, I'm still kind of fleshing it out. And actually, I am in the middle of, um, I want to get some data kind of associated with this, but you know, really studying different aspects of this system. And so I'm in the process of creating a survey for that. Now it's different than what my Google form has been because I've been collecting personal stories from people and then I craft the narrative and then narrate the narrative. This is different because I'm looking at different things with, you know, again, I'm getting more critical in my examination of this. I want you to think about how can you apply this to your situation? Does any of this fit and in what way? Because this is not intended to be a, a one size model and you just plop it on anything because every single company, it's there's little different nuances that are slightly different, but those variances are not that great because overall, they all operate in a very similar, similar, similar way. If you like this type of content, go ahead and, you know, hit that subscribe button. Also make sure that you hit the notification bell and give this video a thumbs up. That type of stuff really does help my videos get seen more. Thumbs up. And remember, change starts now.